there any any comments, questions, or complaints about the day so far? No complaints. Sorry. No complaints. Oh, <laughs> that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, might, I might have missed this because I wasn't here early, but I just wondered if you could give me any um, um, ideas about working with chronic constant pain, being with, being with it. Okay. I don't have chronic constant pain, so it's difficult for me to talk about it from a... Um, personal experience, I think that's always a danger, you know, when we presume to know somebody else's suffering. Um, I have a chronic condition, which is gastritis, so that teaches me a lot about learning to really be kind and very gentle with my body. Um, so I think that's the first kind of approach, is just to really respect your body and not to try and push through the pain at all, but just to make peace with it as best you can. And I think sometimes... You might be able to work directly with the pain, you know, by actually going in and exploring the pain to some extent. But at other times, that's too overpowering, too difficult. And I think at those times, it can be helpful to um, kind of have the approach of, like, say you want to enter a deep ocean. <coughs> you don't want to just dive straight in. That's really overwhelming, really scary, you know. So instead, you walk up to the side of the ocean and you put your little toe in. You know, you <coughs> just feel around the edge of the water to see if it's an okay temperature or not. I did that yesterday and it was very cold. And if you find that that's okay, then you might want to go in a little bit deeper and, and go a bit closer <coughs> to, the, to the fear or in this case to the pain. You know? But I think you need to take it incrementally um, and sometimes find space around the pain that's not directly inside the pain, like so to look for parts of the body which are maybe not hurting so much and to if you like, bring those into the center of your field of perception. Focus on those. I mean, one part of the body which is usually not in pain unless you have arthritis is the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet, for example. And that's a really good way to just take your mind away and find some kind of sensation which is relaxing, um, but you're not right inside the pain. And then when your mind feels a little bit stronger, you might want to approach it a bit. But the other thing, which could be good for, you know, maybe a change or to take your mind away or to strengthen it would be to practice a lot of metta. Um, I don't know if you practice metta. We're going to do some metta at the end, um, sort of generate <coughs> metta towards others. But you can also use metta towards yourself and even towards the pain, you know. So, so learning to kind of infuse the way you look at experience with kindness with a lot of kindness and gentleness, as though you're cradling a child, you know, settling a child. So in a way, like getting a little bit of distance from it and looking after it as though it were a child who were in pain. That can be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, the formal meta practice does help to <coughs> contact some positive emotional feelings, which then can manifest physically as fairly pleasant sensations. And sometimes people are able to actually connect those pleasant sensations that maybe arise in other parts of the body with the area of pain. So you actually hold both in mind together. Does that make sense? Like there's a way that you can um, learn to almost connect the pleasant sensation with the painful part of the body. So, for example, you might feel the pleasant sensation in the heart area if you're practicing metta or in the palms or the soles. And then at the same time, learning to kind of notice the pain whilst not losing touch with those pleasant sensations. So it's like almost bringing those pleasant sensations into the painful area. Does that make sense? It's a kind of learning to hold both together so the mind's not overwhelmed. Um, yeah, that might help. That's probably quite a lot. But can you recommend there's anything I can read around that? I don't know anything, I don't know, maybe somebody else knows something around that. I don't know any specific mm -hmm. books around working with chronic pain, mm -hmm. but I would say any good meditation book which teaches a lot about making peace with your experience and not fighting your experience would be helpful. Um, does anyone have any recommendations? And breath works. Mm -hmm. Breath works? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who's that by? Um, well, Vidya Nala Birch is up here. Yeah, yeah. Been on one of her courses. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't mean to.
seen a bit about pain recently and um, <coughs> found a book uh, called Explain Pain. Yeah. And it's just, it's just really useful to know um, the, um, it from, uh, um, it's very well explained. So that's another, as well as inquiry through meditation, it's also, I, I just found it really clear. Do you know who it's by? No, but I think, it, you know, if you Google it, it's quite well known. Explain pain, it's yeah. a Buddhist it, I'm afraid it's not, no. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Thanks very much, thank you. <coughs> Would you recommend this approach that you've spoken about to sort of, let's call it mental anguish? Mm. I don't mean mental illness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is, well, I, think, I don't know. Uh, I'm yeah. talking about mental anguish. Yeah, the, yeah. When our emotions take over in a bad way. Yeah, yeah. Do you mean the approach I just talked yes. about in yes. reference to the chronic physical yes, pain? Yes, it's holding it together, <coughs> it as a baby. And definitely, definitely. Totally in the water. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but I think sometimes compassion is a really good way to go with the chronic, like, not really chronic, but the mental anguish, despair, those kind of things. Because often what we need more than anything is our own kindness. And, um, you know, often we sort of, I don't know, it's very, very hard to hold mental anguish without a wish to um, escape it. And yet that could be the gateway into a lot of compassion which then can be used to help others, you know, because suffering is part of the Buddhist path. I mean, it's one of the noble truths, and the Buddha said we need to understand that in order to transcend it. So it's not that we want to kind of dive straight in, you know, in, in big pieces that we can't handle straight away, but also we want to learn how to approach it in a way that's not overwhelming. So having that compassion, you know, for yourself in the approach is really, really helpful. And, and just being incredibly gentle with yourself, like not expecting anything. Even just, you know, visiting it for a short period and then saying, okay, now I need a break, go and read a book, have a bath, whatever it is. But not to keep that in your mind the whole time. Um, and also the metta, I think, because that, if you do formal metta practice, it tends to translate into, the, into a certain attitude that we can develop towards everything. So I see metta as like two, there's two aspects. One is like metta or compassion as an attitude to our experience and the other is the formal cultivation of it. So that's like kind of strengthening the metta muscle, if you like. So you could have sessions where you just practice metta and you just con continuously send yourself well wishing. Yeah. Or to, to turn metta into compassion, it's more like sending well-wishing with a reference to the suffering. So may I be free from suffering, may, they, may I learn to hold the pain gently, uh, that kind of thing. And you, you find whatever fits you, you know, a wish for yourself, and you just offer that wish to yourself again and again. Is there any feedback from the um, methods that we discussed about working with thinking? Because uh, this isn't something I've taught very much before. I may have just introduced a little bit into regular retreats. I tend to focus on the kindness aspect <coughs> of practice mostly. And so I'm aware that you know working with thoughts directly may sometimes be, I don't know, a little challenging or you know, take getting used to. Yes. I found um, that your comparison between wanted guests and unwanted guests a very good one. Okay. Um, for kind of trying to get rid of the thoughts that we don't want to bring into our head. Yeah. Yeah. And we began trying to practice that this afternoon. So. Uh huh. Uh huh. Good. Yeah. 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 So you find it helpful to distinguish. I found that was a very helpful way of being able to kind of control those unwanted okay. thoughts. Okay. And, and having heard it come from you today yeah. has helped me in. My, my current situation, my current life, and oh, wonderful. I think it will do going on as well. Yeah, 
Oh, that's great. Um, it's just wise. Yeah. Wise words, and I just found that comparison is a very good one. Okay, great. Uh, you know, I, I, I truly believe our body is a, a temple as well, and, and it, if you look after it and put good things into it, you mm. know, good things will come out. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. For me, that that was a good comparison of, of how to help with our thoughts. Great, great. That's um, wonderful. Yeah. I think you also um, touched at some uh, wisdom in there too, because. Um, <laughs> You know, when you said that just being able to distinguish between the wanted and the unwanted helps you control, you use the word control, but I also think of it in terms of um, letting go of the unwholesome. And sometimes it is enough just to recognise the two, because we have this natural, like, I mean, we don't want to suffer, we don't want to cause ourselves suffering, and it's almost like as though recognising it is sometimes enough. Yeah. Just by recognising it, you're able to see I've how you're harming I've yourself. I've recognised that I've been suffering, and, right. and uh, again through what you said and yeah. other people that I know around in the room have said to let things go. Right. And it, it doesn't matter how many times other people say it yeah. to you, sometimes it just takes a bit of time and time is a key thing with healing yeah. things is yeah. to absorb absorb those words. Right, and, uh, yeah. The yeah. more you've got to let go of, the longer it can take, I guess, you know. So uh, Yeah. But letting go is, yeah. is, is becoming easier. Mm. It's becoming easier to let go of things because a lot of them are just so small and petty things mm, that just mm. seem to uh, irritate or upset yeah. us yeah. sometimes on a daily yeah. basis. Right, know. right, right. I think that's what the Buddha means when he says that that's like carrying the carcass of a dead dog or yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> because the <laughs> fact is it is a beautiful mind and the mind does want to see its own beauty and yet we obscure it in ways that are really not necessary. Yeah. So, and yeah. It comes back to what you're saying about all this kindness and metta mm, mm, mm. and being kind to ourselves. I found where I've been practicing that, mm. that that's helps me be more myself. Great, and, beautiful. Yeah, yeah good. A beautiful mind, exactly. Great. Um, as you <laughs> described it, it's, yeah. it's the potential we all have with it. Exactly, so. it's there, it's just yeah. obscured, that's all. Yeah, great, beautiful. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, as far as um, feeding back yeah. um, about that is concerned, I think it's just tremendously helpful to be reminded that um, thoughts are not all that the mind is, mm. and that thoughts are, you know, sort of visitors in the mind, and like you were mm. saying, and, um, and that there is something else that the mind is, you know, it's like we we can habitually unconsciously just be so consumed mm. you know with the content mm. of our thoughts yes and believe that that's what is the truth yeah. that's the truth it's who we are right. it's solid you know they're yeah. kind of really repetitive and but the investigation yeah you know can you reveal you know this absolutely wonderful truth that that's mm. just not the case right. and that uh, yeah. you know, so we've taken as a practice, you uh -huh. know, it's just so liberating and it's wonderful to just be reminded mm. and given the illustrations, you know, that can, right. you know, sort of, that you can keep with you or can yeah. spring to mind when you are caught. Right, right. So, um, yes. Yeah, um, good, 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 good. In terms of the unwanted thoughts, yeah. it's also about you know, relationships with other people and, and dealing with their thoughts, which are quite strong and dominating yeah. Um, you know, I was finding it very difficult to keep centered because the person was so dominating in the way they were thinking and obviously right behind me underneath was probably angry and mm. the child stuff to drop and um, <coughs> yeah, so what am I trying to say? Just that um, I'm asking really for guidance once again around that kind of relational area mm. where you really want the person to to know that you love them and want the best for them, but because they're throwing so much stuff on mm. you, you're <coughs> not quite giving them what you want to give them. Right. Because you're just trying to cope with things that are coming because the content thing. Yeah. You get caught up in the content. Yeah. I think you've answered your own question because oh. you mentioned that you know you were getting all this and oh, it's good you were getting all this kind of complex stuff you know like a barrage of sort of all kinds of complicated thoughts and stories most probably and projections you know yeah. but you identified that that's coming from a place of anger 
And sometimes I think when we can simplify the narrative down to a key point, that really, really helps us to respond in a wise way. Mm -hmm. So if you can, it's like if you can get under the words and see where that's coming from, you notice it was probably coming from anger, right? Mm -hmm. And then we know how to respond because we understand what anger is and how it feels in ourself. Mm -hmm. So if you can identify, okay, this is the person's anger, you don't need to hear all that, but you can listen yeah. to you know, the pain of that. And then what does anger need? It usually needs just compassion, mm -hmm. right? Or it needs some kind of calm, calmness to be received. <coughs> I mean, it is very difficult when you're being, when you feel attacked, and sometimes you might have to step back from that and, yeah. you know, take a break. But if you can identify as anger, you yeah. know, okay, this is anger in this person, mm. it stops you taking it personally, like they said that to me. Because mm. it's yeah. when there's the, it's happening to me that yeah, it gets yeah. really um, yeah. tricky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I sort of failed and didn't fail, so a mixture of being, oh, I wish I hadn't said that back, and then yeah. I did manage to do a little bit of... Yeah. So, yeah, there's also just dealing with what your own unskillful responses are. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's again where silence can be really great because, um, you know, when somebody's sort of throwing all that stuff at yeah. you, the best thing to do is not respond straight away, but to wait mm. and just give a minute of silence. And then that person has a chance to go, mm, what did I just say? That was, you know, and then they feel their own pain. Whereas if you jump straight back in into that space, they don't feel it. They're just getting caught up with you, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. able to project onto you. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes giving that little bit of silence, even if it's just a small pause, or even if you just need to say, right now, I can't, you know, mm -hmm. I just need a break, or I just need to have a moment to myself. Mm -hmm. It gives them chance to kind of, for the whole thing to de-escalate a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then you might have the chance to go away and see, aha, this person's hurting. Let me just see what this needs, rather than getting involved in the narrative. Mm -hmm. Next time. Mm -hmm. But but don't be hard on yourself because yeah. it's always it's not like we get it or we don't get it. It's just a journey, isn't it? It's just a journey. Yeah, it's just that. That's it doesn't work horrible. straight away. To know that it's not the end of something; it's a gone ongoing. Exactly. Um, yeah. Improve hopefully more skillful. Yeah. Um, but just on terms of your teaching as well today, yeah. I found it really helpful the way you were laying it out. Uh -huh. There's some, I mean, I can't remember it all, I'm going to have to listen again to it all, but just um, how you showed us how it works, you know, you start to calm, how you calm that yeah. one first, and then it goes into this yeah. still place, and then this opens up, and I, I like that, that was helpful. Like yeah. kind of cells that you go into, like one leads into the next. Yeah, I really like that. I mean, this is the beautiful thing when you start to get into the suttas. Thanks to my teachers like Ajahn Brahmali, actually, he's great at this because he really shows how the whole teaching is interconnected. It connects with itself. So anywhere you read in the sutta, you can see, ah, that bit fits in just here, that bit fits in just there. And the whole thing starts to look like this beautiful kind of pyramid that you build up from the ground. And you can just strengthen it anywhere. You don't have to just go straight to the top and strengthen that bit. You can strengthen this bit or this bit or... <laughs> yeah. 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 I got a sense of that. I think that's okay, why good. it was really helpful to see. Yeah. That you, we, are, we only can work at where we're at as well. Right. You can't work, yeah. you need to work at this bit. And all of it's just as valid. That. Yeah, yeah. It's not that only practice on the cushion is important, it's like the whole thing. And some people like the same teacher, Ajahn Gamali. I mean, he took years and years and years to cultivate the foundation. And you can feel it. I mean, I don't know the details, but I can see that it's the last four or five years things are really blossoming for him, you know. And he's really spent a long, long, long time on the cultivation side, really learning about how to use the mind in a way that leads to happiness and dealing with sort of angry thoughts and stuff by reflecting on the good qualities in a person and uh, just constantly <coughs> inclining his mind skillfully in wholesome directions, yeah, yeah. So I think that's great. Because I, I know for me, I mean, I just started by sitting on a cushion and just dealing with whatever contents of the cupboard spilled out of me, you know, it was like, whoa, <laughs> just had to wait for it to go, I didn't have any idea what to do with it, <laughs> yeah, like a really messy cupboard, <laughs> after a while you start to see there's different sections in the cupboard and you can have a few clothes here which are ironed and something here which is only a bit messy, you know, you deal with each section. <laughs> visualize it and that that's something yeah. I can stay with rather uh -huh. than the words often yeah so I found that really useful mm. 
and I guess with um, sort of negative or unwholesome yeah. thinking, it can, if you know, there are patterns, and I, you know, I can see them, and I can yeah. see I've got these patterns of thinking, but it's still quite hard to get out of them, mm. and especially if they come into my body, yeah. and I can really feel them somewhere within mm. my body too, then mm. I feel really kind of stuck with it. Although sometimes yeah. the converse can happen, being in my body can be mm. a way for them to release at the same time. So, yeah. I, you know, so your teaching today was really helpful to think more about metta mm. and compassion and, mm. you know, the, the guests, the invited guests mm. and the uninvited guests mm. and all of those things. They're quite helpful, but it is a very lengthy, it takes, you know, it's, it's years I've been practicing this, it takes yeah. a long time. And I think that's, um, you know, what you reflected there was that, you know, each situation is unique. So sometimes going to the body simplifies the emotion and makes it more tangible. It's easier to release it. It's like it gets it down to one physical point. Mm -hmm. Other times there's so much tension there that it doesn't help because then I guess there's a response, a reaction to that unpleasant sensation, sensation which just escalates the emotion. So it is different every time. And I think that's why we need to learn to work with our physical sensations also in different ways and sometimes you know maybe go straight into them and look at them and you know learn to find some letting go within it but other times maybe move back a bit and you know s widen your awareness um i mean for me the silence reflection is quite useful for that sort of getting a, a more spherical kind of sense like my awareness is bigger and my body is just a small part but you know, I'm moving my awareness beyond that, and that tends to sometimes dilute, sort of a dilution of the intensity of the sensation can happen that way. Okay. Um, yeah. I've never, I've never thought of that. I'll try right, that. Yeah, that can help. Yeah, yeah. But generally, I think just the kindness, just mm -hmm. the kindness. And noticing when you start to sort of contract around something that there is an aversion in there, you know, and maybe what we really need is to, is to just um, kind of soothe that in my, that sensation. Not to try and change it, but just to <coughs> respond like it is a child that's hurting, you know, mm. and respond with kindness. Mm. Acceptance, actually. Acceptance. Acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you said something about uh, having, having a healthy sense of self mm. before being able to let go of the self. Can you say a bit more about that? Please. I'm sort of making that up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's <laughs> something that resonated with yeah. Actually, I, I heard another teacher say yeah. something similar, and I didn't yeah. get the opportunity to ask. It's hard to express. I guess what I've seen often in spiritual circles, and it's quite a known phenomenon now, something called spiritual bypass. And it's my understanding of it, it's quite superficial because I'm not a psychologist. But um, what I've seen in some <coughs> practitioners is that their motivation for practice is a kind of self hatred, actually. And, I mean, whilst there's something very good and wholesome about wanting to improve one's mind, one's you know, inner sense of well-being and verbal and physical behaviour for the sake of, you know, out of compassion for others, um, often there isn't a lot of compassion for oneself. Um, and the tendency can be to want to skip certain steps, you know, whereby we really need to meet ourselves at those places that hurt. But we want to skip over that and get straight to the kind of good stuff, <laughs> if you like. And often that comes from a, a kind of unhealthy relationship with ourselves. So I guess when I'm talking about a, a healthy sense of self, it means developing a good relationship with ourself as we are, rather than as a way to improve. So it's first accepting and embracing ourselves. It's, it's through that accepting and embracing that the transformation happens, but it happens on its own. It's a bit like with the thoughts, you know, when you see an unwholesome thought, recognising it, kind of accepting it, even giving it space to be there is sometimes enough, because then you see, ah, I don't need that, actually that hurts me, and you put it down. So you could, so you, the danger being that you could just be creating more aversion yeah. in your practice, yeah. where you, you sort of, almost a self-deception that you think actually you're mm -hmm. getting yeah. somewhere further, but you're not. Yeah, you just you can be escaping. I mean, there'll be an aspect, there'll be a, a part of that in everybody, I'm sure, because, I mean, to come to this path, we know we want to, you know, 
how would you call it? I mean, most people would think of it as transcending suffering, but the thing is the Buddha taught to understand suffering, not to transcend. It was through the understanding that the escape from suffering was found. So you have to go through to go go, go out. <laughs> and, and in that going through, we need a lot of compassion for ourselves. Like we need to meet ourselves as a conventional being. It's not enough to say, well, there's no one there, so it doesn't matter. I mean, you are there, and you do hurt, and you know, and we have to hold ourselves very gently as we go through those difficult areas, you know, because we're we the same way we would with anybody, you know, with somebody else. Um, yeah. So I guess it's about whether it's a healthy sense of it's a healthy relationship with ourselves. I think. And a lot of patience as well, patience and respect. Uh, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because every um, group or every person that I speak to about practice, I always feel that you can never, ever emphasize self-compassion enough, because generally we just don't have enough, and I mean, I think of myself as quite compassionate, but certainly less so to myself, still. <laughs> it's <laughs> funny, because if you've spent quite a lot of your life not particularly being kind to yourself, yeah. it's actually quite difficult to even know how to to do it on a you know, yeah. sort of sincere way. I know, that's why I like this phrase. I mean, it's very cliche, but I really like it, like being your own best friend mm. and thinking about how you would treat a best friend. You know, like you wouldn't control a best friend. You wouldn't say, right, come on, we're going over here. You've got to <laughs> do this, do that, because I want yeah, you stop. to do it, you yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. You'd be like, okay, how are you feeling? Like, mm. do you feel like doing this or do you feel like going somewhere else? But we don't. We're like, right, you have to sit on your seat for half an hour without moving. And you didn't do it. That's hopeless. I oh, mean, yeah, if you could take you those thoughts <laughs> out <laughs> of your head and verbalise them to someone else, you'd be so ashamed. <laughs> and no yeah, one... That's <laughs> true. That's true. Yes. <laughs> But, you know, we get away with it because we don't know. So I guess it's, again, coming into contact with our thought patterns and seeing them, first of all. And when you see them, say, OK, mm. now, is this really how I would treat someone else? Is this how I'd speak to someone else? Because we're no different from anyone else. Mm. So it's still like, um, it's like not really understanding that we are the same as everyone else. We see ourselves as separate. Mm. You know, everyone else is this group and I am here different than everyone else. I mean every time the Buddha taught he always said to all as to myself, you know, I develop compassion or you know, feelings of metta to all as to myself yeah. so yeah we have to include ourselves <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you need to sort of practice it with others first and then gradually bring yourself in there's this one really nice uh, method that I read about which is um, like creeping up on yourself so you do the meta. We'll do it. We'll do it that way in a minute. Um, <laughs> you do the meta to everybody else, and then you start to bring it into yourself. But the way this was described was like, um, so for example, may my best friend be happy, or may my dog be happy, and then may my dog and I be happy. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, sneak it in so that you've still got the main one going to your friend, but you just kind of hop in on the, on the outside. <laughs> and so you join the flow, if you like. Mm. But that happens anyway when you practice metta, because yes. you start to generate, you start to get this very nice emotional feeling, which is quite grounded, and yeah, it definitely. naturally cultivates mm. a sense of sort of self um, self self respect, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Self respect because you feel good about yourself. Mm. And I mean, if it's like we are completely created by our thoughts in a way. I mean, we're not our thoughts, but we are created by them. So if we're constantly thinking kind things, then our mind will feel kind. You know, like if we're generating an attitude of peace, then eventually the attitude becomes the object. It's suddenly you're watching peace. And it's like, oh, how did that happen? You made it. You made well, peace. Well, that sort of happened this afternoon because I was using that you know, <coughs> word peace quite a lot in that sort of meditation, and it's definitely uh, yeah. calmed down quite a lot. Yeah. The reason I put that in is because I asked uh, Imagine Brown to do that for me <coughs> and just say the word peace because I love his voice. I don't know, because it just resonates with the peace for me and his whole being resonates with peace so I said to him before my selfie treat I said can you just do a guided meditation just for me 
for like five minutes. He only did one minute, but he just basically <laughs> said the word peace several times. And then in my little cave, you know, I stayed in that cottage for two weeks. I just would play it from mm. time to time, and I'd get completely like, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> really, really peaceful. And then I'd just put it off, and yeah, kind of the mind, it wants the peace, and it inclines to the peace. It just needs a little, mm. a little nudge. Mm. The mind's actually very sensitive. It doesn't need to be told, right, you go, you know. It's actually really sensitive. So you just have to say one thing, and it, it responds. Same with negative thought. Mm. I mean, it's difficult to, you know, I think it was said earlier, to sort of let go of the negative thoughts, but I think by increasing the sort of positives, mm. that, that exactly. is the way to sort of that'll... Yeah, that's the other simile of the guest. It's like yes. you have all your friends around to tea, the, the others won't fit in the door. The unwanted guests can't <laughs> get in, you know. There's too, much, too many friends in there. It's a nicer path, actually, when you yeah. focus more on cultivating the wholesome. Because yeah. we're always playing around with the unwholesome stuff, and it's like, it drags you down after a bit. <laughs> yeah. um, th this isn't a very well-formed thought, but just yeah. as we're talking, I was thinking, well, for myself anyway, <coughs> the link between self-compassion and right effort. Yeah. Well, and it went back to that. You know, there's a verse in the Dharmapada, where, and I can't remember, the, this is just as a flexure, you know, gets the arrow nice and sharp. So a skillful practitioner sort of develops themselves mm -hmm. in, in terms of like becoming a better person. Oh, okay. And I, to give an example, yeah. for myself, say as I tend to, I tend to be by nature quite aversive, so I get yeah. irritated. Yeah. So uh, a way of self-compassion would be to say, oh, well, don't worry, Michael, because you have every right to feel that because, you know, <laughs> that person's a bit of a <laughs> so, so. Which would then, oh, I can't be kind to myself, so I'll just go on. Whereas a more uh, skillful or a more difficult response would be to say, yeah, but because you keep thinking that, then you, so why don't you self-consciously be kind to somebody when you don't really feel like it, yeah. and then you will feel better, you know. Yeah. But it, that does require an effort. So in, in yeah. one sense, it's not very compassionate because right. you don't feel like it, but that was a more effective kind of compassion. Mm. And I think it's particularly in our society because we're so sort of rights-orientated and I will do what I want to do, you know, like yeah. me, me, me. So, so we automatically go to kind of excuse ourselves, and, you know, right. or, or take the easy course, you know, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. kind of what I'm thinking. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in the first term mm. um, approach, it's, um, you know, the kind of, well, you know, I, I have every right to feel like that, because yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. suffering, whatever. And it's anger, kind you know, of it's almost glorified. Something. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah. that's not really... Feel your anger, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, instead of saying, well, you know, I've got the right to feel like it, it's maybe more like self-compassion to me would be more like, um, um, how do I feel and what does what do I need? Like, what does this feeling need? You know, like, because you are annoyed and you do have every right to feel it, in the sense that to give yourself the validation without yes. justifying yeah. it, like, yeah. because often when there's anger, there's actually hurt, mm. yes. I think, yes. anyway. Yes. I think yes. behind yes. anger yes. is often and hurt. I'm going right back to early childhood. Yeah, and, and when you can sort of contact the hurt side, it's such a much softer emotion, isn't it? It softens the emotion a lot. And, um, and when you feel that sort of, that grief, it's so much easier to sort of... Well, I mean, it's kind of, it makes you feel vulnerable. I mean, anger is kind of like a shield, so you don't feel so vulnerable. But I think when you are able to feel vulnerable, it's harder in the beginning, but you, you elicit more sympathy from yourself yeah. somehow. Yeah. Yes. I'd just like to say one last thing. Sure. On the days where I've, I've been kinder to myself, I've found that the whole world seems to be having a better day. So I don't yeah. know if that's the same for the rest of you, but yeah. I, I feel that it's, it doesn't just benefit me. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Explanation of the meta practice of meditation. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's really interesting because then the question is like, oh, is the rest of the world happy or is it just that I'm noticing <laughs> that more, you know? Is it just a, a perception? Yeah. 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 
Yeah, because in a way the whole of the world is a perception. I mean, it's mm. just how I view it depending on my mood. Like if I look at my past on a bad day, it looks like a tragedy, you know. It looks like everything's mm. gone wrong and it's brought me to this place which is rotten. <laughs> but if I feel happy today, I look at my past, oh, that had to happen to bring me here. And bring me here. And you know, it all went so well, I could have never known how well it would work out, you know. <laughs> so you see it totally differently based on your state of mind now. So I think that's why, you know, if you put these, like, rose-tinted glasses of meta on, the whole world looks rosy. Yeah. And that's totally valid, totally valid. I mean, you might as well choose the ones that, you know, <laughs> that make you happier, because none of it's true until yeah. we get to the point where, you know, until we get to the point where yeah. there's really no hindrances and we're seeing things completely objectively with totally deep, penetrating wisdom. Mm-hmm. None of it's absolutely accurate, so we might as well see it in a way that's, benefiting ourselves and everyone else mm. yeah I mean I think in that way meta practice can be a, an insight practice mm. because you see that perception is conditioned you know we're, we're creating the way we see the world and then you stop believing in your perceptions quite so much <coughs> and also you have the capacity to like put down one and pick up another you know and the Buddha's talking about doing that all the time, like with the first method of overcoming thoughts, it's substitution. You substitute one with another, so it's like, you, you can play. It gets very fun, actually, when you have various tools in the box and you can start to play with them a little bit. You're not just, you know, doomed to always see things with the same cranky mind. <laughs> well, I think that also the happiness comes also, like personal self-happiness will come from and it's achievable through that being kind to yourself yeah. as well as compassionate and kind to definitely. And, and, you know, definitely focusing and, and, yeah. and, and thinking about that as well as being meditating yeah, and yeah, yeah I mean this is all part of sila you know, like we read before it's not only sort of abstaining from harmful actions it's cultivating kindness it's doing kind things it's thinking kind things it's, you know, learning to perceive in kind ways so it's all part of the training of the body and mind yeah, it's, the, it's the ethics that's what ethics is you know there's it's such a deep subject it's not just don't do this do that you know it's like you can always be kinder yeah, yeah. And i think the world needs a lot more kindness yeah. and happiness absolutely yeah. absolutely maybe, maybe that's my mis- 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 preconception of it from <laughs> how i see it the thing is ha- kindness doesn't harm anyone so you can't really have too much yeah. you know yeah, <laughs> not possible <laughs> Good. It's, it's a fine line, isn't it, if between having rose-tinted glasses and having all that meta, but being congruent and honest about what you're feeling mm. Yeah. Mm. too. Mm. So, yeah. Not, yeah. not sort of having one foot in both areas, knowing that you might be feeling this and yeah, yeah, being yeah. really truthful about that. Right. But then saying, actually, I need to, I can change my perception too, yeah. if yeah. I choose to, and I'm going to... Yeah focus more on meta mm, mm, mm. I think um, that's that's how it is for me anyway yeah, having to yeah. straddle both camps right, right, right I think sometimes people think of meta as only a good feeling mm-hmm. which is why I always think of it as two things like one is yes cultivating the wholesome feeling but the other is an attitude of meta so that means the way you relate to unpleasant things too it doesn't mean you always should be happy it just means that yes there's suffering too but I can be kind to that as well mm-hmm. so I can bring that into the meta so then it's, it's authentic. Yeah. You know, if we can only feel meta when we're in a good mood, it's not really meta at all. Mm. That is just kind of a, a, a good mood thing, <laughs> <laughs> which is not you know, going to be there all the time. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think all of the practice... I mean, if it's really genuine meta, genuine compassion, you first have to feel how you feel. That's the only way you can know how to respond appropriately. You know, there's some people who say things like, oh, compassion... Meta, it's just a, um, it's just an intention. It doesn't really have to involve empathy. Mm-hmm. But I really disagree with that because it's the empathy that helps us understand another. And when we understand another's suffering, we're able to respond in a way that's actually appropriate. Mm-hmm. You know, like if somebody's just lost a loved one, it's not appropriate to say, "Oh, I hope you, I hope you're happy." because mm-hmm. yeah, they're not happy so at that point it's like okay you have to resonate first with how they're feeling and then oh may your suffering you know be alleviated what can I do to help you you know through your suffering that's much more appropriate than saying oh maybe you'd be happy and yeah, I don't want to know <laughs> about it so I think we have to first 
again, you know, contact the suffering, resonate with that, and then from there, the, the metta and the compassion and the equanimity, etc., that grows from that is much more, it's wiser. Yeah. Much wiser. Yeah, yeah. yeah last, last question. Yeah, I've always had a problem finding the kind of authentic quality yeah. of metta, but um, uh, one thing that I found quite useful was listening to a talk by John Cicito <coughs> where he was just describing it as being there. It's, it's like yeah. a fundamental resonance. We're all empathic beings. Yeah. We all want to be liked and, yeah. and want to, you know, it's, yeah. it's something that's yeah, just yeah. kind of part of the fabric of the Vegeta, really. Definitely. And uh, I, I felt I could kind of get some like oh, that. Yeah, it, nice. it seemed to kind of tie everything together somehow. Yeah, like lovely. Way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I call my project after his um, word that he loves so much about empathetic resonance because our project, the Bikini, I'm, I'm trying to create a monastery for women to yeah. ordain and practice and for everybody to come and practice. And uh, we called it Anukampa, which means a kind of sympathetic resonance. It's another word for compassion, basically, but it does carry that sense of empathy. Mm. Like Anu means like, and Kampa, Anu means like small, small, tiny, little, and Kampa means like trembles. So it's like literally kind of resonating with somebody. Mm. It's compassion, but it's, it's emphasizing that aspect of empathy. Yeah, yeah, feeling what they feel and responding to that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's completely. Um, it's not something we're creating to make no. ourselves feel happy or good. It's no, not good at all. I mean, it's just, just it's there, just there. Kind of. Yeah, we care. Yeah. Especially there when we're able to feel vulnerable, I think, and contact our own suffering, then we feel it much more acutely for others as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like if you saw a child drowning in a lake, you know, you wouldn't really have to think. Hopefully. I mean, if you can't swim, maybe you'd have to think twice. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we have that natural response. Yeah. Good. So it's almost the end of the day, which always <coughs> comes rather quickly. 